this. Um, okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Many thanks for taking the time to come up to Stormont this afternoon for the KS seminar series. Um, my name is John Topping, and I'm a lecturer in criminology at Queen's University Belfast, and I'm also a fellow of the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. And today I am here to discuss PSNI stop and search powers with a particular focus around children and young people, as we'll come on to. This, uh, what I'm talking about today, represents uh, really a snapshot into some ongoing research I'm conducting with Professor Ben Bradford at University College London, uh, and also, as I'll talk about in a little while, the Young Life and Time Survey, housed as part of the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, run every um, year. And probably stop and search is one of those ubiquitous um, policing terms which no doubt many of you have in the room will be familiar with. But really today I want to consider stop and search from what we might term everyday powers. Okay, really um, those, uh, those powers uh, under primarily the Police and Criminal Evidence Northern Ireland Order of 1989 and also the Misuse of Drugs Act. 1971. Because I think while a significant amount of attention over the years has been afforded to security related stop and search powers such as those under the Terrorism Act or those under the Justice and Security uh, Northern Ireland Act of 2007, the everyday powers and these normal powers have re remained really conspicuous by their absence I think from, uh, from substantive debate and especially in view of the significant changes to the use of stop and search uh, in England and Wales and Scotland over the past five years, Northern Ireland really remains as the, the last policing jurisdiction in the UK to have attracted much attention, actually if any at all. Um, so really, uh, you know, part of that reason uh, perhaps has been because there has been a twin focus in Northern Ireland on, of course, on one hand, police reform, uh, and also on the other hand, the security related issues in Northern Ireland and really the I think the the superficial or banal issue of, of ordinary everyday stop and search as normal policing has fallen um, as I'll talk about between these two pillars and really transmuted into good policing practice precisely because of course it signals away from policing associated with the past. So hopefully over the next uh, 20 minutes I'll be able to bring you up to speed on where we are in addition to what I have to say much more detailed policy brief uh, in your packs. Okay, um, and I suppose to start with, these everyday stop and search powers, um, when you look at them objectively on a case by case basis, they're actually almost impossible to legally question. Indeed, we don't follow and monitor the individual decision making of every police officer, every minute of every shift of every day. But it's when you start to piece together the wider patterns of stop and search usage by PSNI it's then that we can start to see some of the issues emerging with regard to the scope and the nature and the focus of use in and around those powers. And I suppose looking at something tangible um, and the legal boundaries around these everyday stop and search powers for PSNI. And of course we mainly have, as I've already mentioned, PACE 1989 and, and MDA, the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. And the accompanying um, PACE Code of Practice A, which is almost identical uh, to that of England and Wales. So suppose when you're looking at it uh, in this regard, volume, proportionality and arrest rates remain as very much legitimate points of comparison. And this of course begs the first question and the obvious question for PSNI in terms of how much are they doing. But before I get to that, I just want to contextualise the, the, the question of how much um, stop and search beyond just simple statistics. And I think the first key point is the overall picture, the overall nature of stop and search powers in Northern Ireland. At present in England and Wales, 99.7% of all stops and searches are conducted under PACE normal type legislation. In Northern Ireland, only 70% of all stop and searches are conducted under this PACE type legislation, with the rest under security legislation, mainly actually the Justice and Security Northern Ireland Act of 2007, very understandably because of the severe dissident threat that we still have. The other second contextual point I want to say is that it's also noticeable that since 2010-11 and this comparative point, stop and search um, in England and Wales has actually declined by 75% from a peak of 1.2 million to just over 303,000 in 2016. 17, really since a renewed focus on use of the powers and some problems associated with it uh, by Theresa May during her time as Home Secretary. And in Scotland too, 
while governed under a very, very different legal regime, which we won't talk about today, stop and search there has again, over the same time period, reduced by 85%, um, as I've said. So this itself demonstrates stop and search is as much actually a police behaviour, which can be modified and changed where pressure is applied. But in contrast, what we can see, and I'll talk about the graph, what we can see is PSNI's use of the power has remained entirely static over the same period. It's not how high up the green line is, it's the fact it's flat in comparison to, to what we're seeing in England and Wales. And it's remained entirely static at approximately 31,000 stops and searches per year over the last five years. And for some of you in the room, that may sound like a little, that may sound like a lot. But when we turn those absolute figures into proportional figures per thousand of population uh, as, as a way of comparing, it actually means PSNI are undertaking stop and search in 2016-17 at a rate of 17 per thousand of population. And that compares to 9 per thousand in Scotland and 5 per thousand in England and Wales. But if we actually strip out the security-related stops and searches uh, for Northern Ireland, as I've already said, make up about um, a third, it still means that PSNI are undertaking stop and search at a rate of 13 per thousand of population, still significantly higher than anywhere else in the UK. And additionally, if we take a step back and look at the longer-term use of stop and search in Northern Ireland, we actually see use of the PACE-type stop and search power, so that combination of PACE, MDA, has actually increased by 74% between 2004-05 and 2015-16. So it is rather anomalous um, as part of this, the ongoing work that within the hyper-accountable environment, I suppose you could call it, hyper-accountable policing environment of Northern Ireland, that stop and search has been allowed to flourish to the extent that it has. But I think beyond volume then, what about effectiveness? Okay, does it work? Does the practice of stop and search, um, in the words of PSNI, to quote off their website, act as an operational tool to prevent and detect crime? Okay. And one of the main, if blunt, tools to measure this, of course, are through arrest rates. And here we can see that PSNI's overall arrest rate for stop and search six, sits at 6% in stark contrast to 17% in England and Wales with arrest rates as low as 3% in three of PSNI's 11 districts. And again, removing the security-related figures, what we actually see when you drill down into the data is that, in fact, 75% of all PSNI's everyday stops and searches are conducted, actually, under the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, which itself specifically yields an arrest rate for 1617 of 5.7%. Or, in other words, 94 out of every 100 stop and searches by PSNI do not result in any further action. And one policy-based um, evidence argument uh, related to this fact is that, well, it must be deterring crime and, you know, of course, it just works. But the legal inconvenience, uh, actually, to that argument is that deterring crime is not the underpinning legal principle for conducting PACE-type stops and searches. It is, in fact, guided by the investigative concept of reasonable suspicion. That itself is a legal test which must be satisfied every single time for a normal stop and search to meet the legal threshold to engage it. And on this point, um, we know from Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary back in 2013, of course it's been renamed now, that around 27% of stop and searches conducted in their sample across England and Wales did not meet the legal threshold of reasonable suspicion to justify use of the power. So if we put that in the context of Northern Ireland's 31,000 stops and searches for 1617, that would hypothetically equate to 7,500 stop and searches potentially not being properly conducted. And again, it's only hypothetical, and I'm not suggesting it is the case. But let's have a look at the wider evidence around stop and search and reasonable suspicion. Because again, the same HMI research shows that officers are not actually fully aware or clear about what constitutes grounds for reasonable suspicion. Uh, really described as a tool more for officers and sections who prefer adversarial styles of policing or to demonstrate control and as I'll come on to talk about especially for groups who challenge police authority and based on the poor outcomes or arrests for PSNI uh, I don't think that point can be entirely dismissed because it is clear that the object of the search is not actually matching the outcome when we only have a six percent arrest rate. 
And I suppose like many other assumed forms of policing, um, we also know that as a crime fighting practice, the evidence around stop and search effectiveness doesn't actually stack up. Because on the one hand, there are a whole host of conflated claims uh, around detection, around deterrence, the assumption that well, it simply works, that the police need this power, they should have it. Um, but what we do know is that for every 52 crimes recorded by PSNI, there is only one arrest via stop and search. And significantly, the very latest, most up-to-date research coming out of the College of Policing and the Home Office shows us that stop and search has no statistically significant effect on reducing entire categories of crime. And again, you may be able to see that more clearly from your handouts. And those categories include criminal damage, vehicle crime, <laughs> robbery, theft, and of course, certain sorts of crime which happen outside of public space, such as domestic abuse or cybercrime. And that is not to say stop and search does not stop some crime in some circumstances. Well, six out of every hundred stops for PSNI. But for example, calls to increase stop and search to combat certain forms of criminality, such as, I'll take the recent example in London around knife crime, they're well-intentioned, but they actually presuppose the reality of effectiveness. All the evidence that we know in relation to Operation Blunt related to knife crime in England and Wales actually found increases in stop and search had a negligible, in some cases, zero effect on reducing knife crime. And we actually know knife crime also went down in some areas where Operation Blunt was not even in effect. Yet in spite of this, we have had politicians, even the last few days, police chiefs, still calling for increases in stop and search to reduce knife crime. So what the evidence shows us is that, in reality, there is a marginal but also a complex relationship between stop and search and its direct relationship, if you like, to reducing certain sorts of crime. And again, not forgetting that stop and search is not the only way to deal with crime. But of course, as a visible form of policing, it's easier to see the popular symbolic appeal of policing being seen to be done on the streets. So out of this situation, we've got a couple of key questions are really raised. Firstly, for stop and search at PSNI officer level, and remembering the 6% arrest rate, is the bar for the legal test of reasonable suspicion set too low, somewhere within the organisation, or is it not being objectively applied? Uh, is the intelligence or information stop and searches are being based on not adequate? What influences that which constitutes the viability of stop and search in the minds of officers collectively within PSNI? And why is it still being used at relatively high rates, uh, relatively unchecked within the organisation? Because again, the persistently low arrest rates suggest application of the power and reasonable suspicion is not as rigorous as it could be. And I suppose on a more, on a more strategic point as well, with stop and search as a, I suppose we could describe it on, based on the data, as a consistent policing tactic by PSNI over the past five years compared with the drops in England and Wales and Scotland, in recognition that it is generally ineffective and in some cases a counterproductive crime fighting tool. Um, the issue of whether the tactic of stop and search has in fact become the strategy for dealing with certain sorts of crime and certain types of people, I think is a valid question. And certainly we don't have the space to consider in detail today um, uh, you know, some further issues around that. But of course, another glaring question sits out for us. What effect is stop and search having on the other 94% for whom no further action is actually taken? And at a glance, what we do know is that evidence shows that there is an overall net negative damaging effect on police community relations with police initiated contacts such as those through stop and search as generally more damaging to people's perceptions of fairness and legitimacy of the police. All the evidence, empirical evidence, points to that. So when we think about the general clustering and concentration of stop and search within what we know generally socioeconomically deprived areas, when we think of the low arrest rates, when we think of potential histories of the police in Northern Ireland in certain areas, we can start to see how problematic stop and search can be. Because we have to remember, of course, stop and search by its legal nature uh, is not random nor equally spread and applied. So though again, there are more complex relationships there between deprivation and marginality and the so-called what we would call the availability pool of people for police who actually live 
in those areas. And we don't have to look too far back to Brixton 1981 or the London riots of 2011 to see how toxic the effects of stop and search actually have been. So in view of the evidence um, to date, um, and talking a little bit more, looking towards the Light, Young Life and Time survey and, and other more forward-facing research, what about the specific focus of stop and search on children uh, under 18s legally defined in Northern Ireland in the time I have left? And just to, to go through some facts and figures for you, between 2010-11 and 2017-18, it now stands that stop and search has been used against children under 18s over 30,000 times. For 2016-17 alone, children made up 17% of all PSNI's pace type stop and searches, everyday stops. And using specifically the 15 to 17 year old male category. The stop and search rate for Northern Ireland, while already relatively high at 13 per thousand for ordinary stops, for 15 to 17 year old males runs at 82 per thousand of population or in other words, are being stopped at a rate of four times proportional to their numbers in, in the wider Northern Ireland population. And additionally, of the nearly 28,000 stops and searches of children generally, between 2010-11 and 2016-17, only in 2,500 cases has further action been taken. And I'm just gonna, not going to spend any time on this, but this just gives you a bit of a snapshot. Green are the stops and searches, reds are where further action has been taken, and the amber is where nothing further has happened. So that paints the, the long-term picture of stop and search interaction with children in Northern Ireland. And I suppose in taking a step back from some of these figures, it's important to consider the legal and um, policy framework around stop and search for children. And very clearly, uh, Code of Practice A, as it applies in Northern Ireland, states three very clear, very simple things. Firstly, that stop and search should be subject to fair and reasonable use according to section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. Secondly, and to quote, the Chief Constable should ensure that in the exercise of their function, officers have regard to the need to safeguard and promote the welfare of all persons under 18 years, and that the decision to stop and search a child must be in the best interest of a child and in compliance with obligations under Article 3 of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. And thirdly, that if the fundamental, fundamental principles are not observed, the use of the powers to stop and search may be drawn into question. Failure to use a power in the proper manner reduces their effectiveness. So in considering these core principles, considering the age-related stop and search figures have been provided by PSNI to the Northern Ireland Policing Board since 2011, Considering PSNI's statement after age-related stop and search statistics were released for the first time only last year, in January of 2017, and I quote from PSNI, we have processes in place to ensure that stop and search powers are used properly, legitimately and proportionately in preventing and detecting crime. And looking at PSNI's own code of ethics, which states that any disproportionate use of police powers must be justified, the question is why are children and young people being targeted to the extent that they are? In part, we do know that research from the Northern Ireland Policing Board demonstrates, for example, that PSNI officers view young people as a separate and very different social grouping in society rather than equal citizens. The logic of which is that they are also potentially, or as the evidence shows, actually treated and viewed differently, as we'll talk about the Life and Time survey. Um, but more specifically, we also have years of evidence pointing to the fact that stop and search is being mainly directed at young males from socio-economically deprived communities and perceived to be used variously as a form of harassment, mistreatment and control. And this matters a lot, okay? because firstly, research shows us that young people not only use, but in fact value public space, street, leisure time for identity, for independence, for belonging, for friendship, for security. Or in other words, the science of hanging out. But at the same time, this also renders, of course, young people much more visible in the public and the police eye. And secondly, then layering on issues of socioeconomic deprivation and marginalisation, uh, research also shows us that a range of additional factors, including low socioeconomic status, truancy from school, previous police contact of a young person with their friends, uh, uh, lower educational attainment, unemployment, living in social housing and health problems are all positively correlated to increased chances of being stopped and searched. So by virtue of circumstances outside the control 
of young people in Northern Ireland other than being up to no good or criminality, this particular section of young people are more likely to be stopped and searched by PSNI. Um, and I suppose that, that what I want to talk about very briefly, the most recent data and, uh, from the 2018 Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, Young Life and Time Survey, which is actually going to be launched on the 23rd of this month of May at Queen's and Belfast. As the data confirms, children both perceive and experience directly that the powers are not being used appropriately. And as the first ever nationally representative survey of 16-year-olds through the Life and Time survey on their experiences of stop and search powers, evidence points to the fact that the power is being used outside its legal and procedural limits, as you can see from the figures, and also being experienced significantly differentially across class and religious lines. Uh, and again, this is just to give a very brief, just for note, the broad age profile of stop and search uh, over the last number of years. Um, so all in all, a lot of information in a relatively short space of time, but that is the current complex p picture of stop and search in Northern Ireland beyond generalist assumptions around the power. And I think set against the continued consistent use of stop and search by PSNI as a tactic, in spite of the evidence which shows it's not effective, in spite of the relatively high levels of stop and search being conducted here, and um, the, the use of stop and search against children in Northern Ireland, questions related to whether the same ends could be achieved by more pro-social community-oriented means, I think, should and need to be foregrounded. And finally, finally, on the big issue of data, very significant questions remain. Without more open and transparent stop and search data, how can anybody at a public level, and not least to the oversight function of the Northern Ireland Policing Board, uh, be sure at a public level that use of the power is meeting obligations under PS Code of Practice A, under Section 75, under the Human Rights Act of 1998, under PSNI's Code of Ethics, under the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child? Because the current evidence strongly suggests that use of the power is not necessarily meeting those thresholds. And similarly, when so many other elements of police work in Northern Ireland are so closely monitored, why is the main adversarial contact between PSNI and the public generally and children specifically left out? The simple answer is that without more thorough attention through the official policing oversight channels, and until we start to move down the road of the reform process uh, in England and Wales, such as through the, the College of Policing's best use of stop and search principles as a means of changing stop and search behaviours, the current picture for PSNI stop and search practice is unlikely to change anytime soon. Thank you.